afternoon, everyone. It's always a terrible assignment to follow a professional writer and novelist with the experience that Beverly has. She really knows how to put words together. And, and I'm just a country boy, and I don't know if I can do that. But just yeah, right. give me, please. Give me. My, um, my older sister and brother-in-law went up to New York to go to some Broadway plays recently, uh, well, several years ago. And my brother-in-law at the time was the president of South Carolina SAR. He's very much a patriot, and they heard about this new play about Hamilton. Nobody had ever written much about it. I mean, it's brand new. And they got tickets, course tickets were no big deal to get it first, and went in there, and it blew them away. And at, at the um, intermission, they were deciding whether to leave or not, because they were so shocked about what they saw. But that shock has taken the world by storm. And my friend John Oller told me that I could probably get a ticket if I was a good boy and had an $800 bill. <laughs> to get a ticket to a musical. So, yeah. <laughs> so there is a way that comes from that that's wonderful. And it's the um, popular acclaim of Alexander Hamilton and beginning to understand that complex human being. And one of his very good friends, John Lawrence. So John, Allison, and I are here today to talk a little bit about John Lawrence and to try to put him into perspective and that way, when you get your $800 bill and go up and see the play Hamilton and Lawrence is featured in the play, you'll have some idea of the character behind the uh, man that's um, being portrayed. Now, John Lawrence was born with the, literally, with the proverbial silver spoon in his mouth. He was the first son of Henry Lawrence who was one of the wealthiest men in South Carolina, which made him one of the wealthiest men in the 13 colonies. So he's the oldest son, and his father did, as was the custom of South Carolina's very elite, is you send your son to Europe to be educated. So he was sent to England, he then went to Switzerland, back to England, and at first he was going to study the old profession of being a physic. And then he decided, no, nah, being medicine isn't too much fun. I want to be a lawyer. No, I'm <laughs> well, John Lawrence met a nice young lady in England and married her. Um, when she was pregnant, the Revolutionary War fever swept over the United States. And of course, Lawrence, being in London, read the papers, read the pamphlets, and understood it. And he was, as many, many young men are, anxious to go to the fight, to earn fame, to earn his name, uh, to make his name in the war. So he leaves his pregnant wife in England and travels to, back to South Carolina. And he, his dad, at the time, is in Congress, that Henry Lawrence will serve twice as President of Congress, the Chief Executive Officer of the nascent United States of America. So he says, well, I know this fellow from Virginia named George Washington. He's got some young men on his staff, and so you just go out and volunteer to be on Washington's staff, and so John Lawrence did that. And there he made two excellent friends. Number one, Alexander Hamilton, and number two, the young Marquis de Lafayette. And since John was multilingual and Lafayette had only begun to study English, they became English study partners, and as well as they were about the, the same age, and maybe in the United States, uh, aristocracy, maybe a little bit sort of in the same type social class. Although you got to remember that the young Marquis was in the royal court in uh, France, and he was Bill Gates of France. He was filthy, filthy rich. And he got it the old-fashioned way, and he inherited it. <laughs> so John Lawrence was always had one fear in his life. 
And that fear that motivated him was that the war was going to get over before Lawrence could find glory on the field of combat. So even though he was on Washington's staff, and he did eventually go from volunteer status to where Congress commissioned him as a lieutenant colonel on Washington's staff, at the famous fights of Brandywine and Germantown, this staff officer climbed up into the uh, compact position, and on the second battle, he finally got himself wounded. But that wasn't the only time he managed to do that. At Monmouth Courthouse, he went out and exposed himself again. Once again, a staff officer out there leading troops. And he was extremely aware of George Washington's disgust to the bone with General Charles Lee. He approached General Lee. Lee dismissed him as an earwig, you know, a hanger's own of George Washington. And so, instead of having a court martial anything, as we good Southerners do, we're going to resolve it by a duel. So, our friend John Lawrence and General Charles Lee have a duel, and Lee is actually wounded in that duel. I don't know if anybody's pride was um, was placated in that duel, but it. But if you think Henry Lawrence Lawrence doesn't want to get out of the fight, uh, you don't really know much. Lawrence then comes back to South Carolina in time for two different things. Number one, he arrives just as Augustine Prevost has invaded from Georgia with a land force and is coming toward Charleston. He goes to uh, Moultrie. William Moultrie is the commander of the ground forces um, that are opposing Prevost. They're at Coosahatchee River about where I-95 crosses the Coosahatchee. Lawrence is sent forward to bring the advanced Americans off the battlefield up to Tullifinney Hill. So next time you go down 95, there's a steep hill about 50 feet higher than the Tullifinney River. Then you go down into a plain, you cross the Tullifinney, you go about a mile and a half, you cross the Coosahatchee in that area. Moultrie has displayed his army across Tullifinney Hill on the high ground to uh, oppose Prevost's investigation. About a fourth of Moultrie's uh, army is down right at Coosahatchee on the Charleston side of the Co Coosahatchee, or the east side of the Coosahatchee, to oppose the crossing. So Lawrence, for glory, instead of bringing those troops off, rallies them all up and says a fourth, a fourth of Moultrie's army is going to whip 2,000 British at Goosehatchee and gets in a fight. And he probably would have gotten himself and a lot of other people killed, except that um, he was wounded early on in this misfortune. His officers were able to drag him off the field and get these men to relative safety. The rest of the story, though, is that once a fourth of your army is kind of beaten up and they trickled up Tullifinney Hill, Moultrie felt that he could not no longer stand there and fight, so Moultrie retreats all the way to Charleston in 1779. <coughs> Thankfully, Charleston didn't fall, and the Americans and the French decided then in the fall of 79 to go and attack the uh, British stronghold of Savannah. Uh, once again, there were very furious attacks, especially at Spring Hill Redoubt. Uh, Francis Marion's role there is second South Carolina, at least part of it. It is there at the hill, as is John, John Lawrence leading a charge, so he evidently heals up pretty well. That's in, um, in 1779. 1780, John Lawrence is um, in Charleston. When Charleston falls, he's captured. He's fairly quickly exchanged. He's exchanged faster than anyone else. And um, he um, is able to um, go to Philadelphia and get back in the war there. He is fairly soon sent to France as an emissary to raise some more money from the French, and um, he's able to be successful in that, and he gets back just in time for the end stages of the siege of Yorktown. If you know anything much about Yorktown, there's some critical far-out readouts that need to be taken, and George Washington had amongst his family more people 
that were like Lawrence than were. And so basically it was almost all junior officers and staff officers who decided they were going to go charge this readout and take it from these soldiers. Under Alexander Hamilton's leadership, John Lawrence, Alexander Hamilton, and lots of other young officers charged and were successful in taking that readout. And that, of course, helped convince Lord Cornwallis to surrender at Yorktown. Um, because of his connections, his political connections, and no doubt he was extremely intelligent, John Lawrence was appointed as one of the commissioners to negotiate the peace with Lord Cornwallis. And then after the British formally surrendered, um, Washington appointed Lawrence as his commissioner of prisoners. Now, is that a big deal? Well, let me tell you why. Uh, and I'm sure this irony wasn't lost on George Washington. He was a very bright guy. If you're the Duke of Earl like Cornwallis was, you have lots of different jobs for you, which you get a little stipend. And one of the things that Cornwallis was, was the keeper of the Tower of London. That was just one of his many jobs. Well, guess who they were keeping as a guest in the Tower of London? They had captured Henry Lawrence at sea. And Henry Lawrence was not a military officer. He was a political treasonist, and they kept him there. So now the keeper of Lord Cornwallis is Henry Lawrence's son, John, who is, who is the keeper of his father. Now, it sets up for some interesting negotiations because the British are generally willing to swap a private for a private or a captain for a captain or a colonel for a colonel, but they didn't really want to swap off any high-level political prisoners, which Henry Lawrence was a high-level political prisoner. So negotiations went off and the decision was finally reached with the King and Parliament involved to swap Henry Lawrence out of the Tower of London for Lord Cornwallis. And of course the son was involved in those um, politics. Immediately beats it back here in South Carolina and links up with Light Horse Harry Lee. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about geography because I'm personally fascinated with it. There's a body of water, which is pretty wide now, I'd say three quarters of a mile wide, that separates the mainland from South Carolina from uh, James Island, which is one of the seacoast islands south of Charleston. The British inhabited James Island, and of course it would be great if the Americans could, could run them out of there. The problem is that Nathaniel Green didn't have a single rowboat. He didn't have a single marine. Yet he needed some marines. And so Lee and Lawrence picked up this idea to take 700 men across about three quarters of a mile of open water when there's about an equal number of British troops on the island and two um, galleys that are armed with cannons part to keep them from doing that at night in January at low time. I'll pass up on that, Charles. Yeah. Well, what a plan. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful letter that Green writes when Lee and Lawrence propose the plan, and he explains to them, guess what? I don't have a single boat. The British control the waterways. You know, when you get those men over there, they're going to be wet and cold. There's not going to be any cannons, there's not going to be any cavalry, and you're, and you're going to be over there on those islands, and I can't support you. I can't help you, but because you're a Lee from Virginia, because you're a Lawrence from South Carolina, I wouldn't stand in the way of you killing off 700 men. So this um, operation, interestingly, almost succeeds. Half of the men actually wade across the um, what is now the intercoastal waterway, the Stone O, about where the Stone O and the Wadmawal River run together and, and get over there. The other half got lost. So now you got half of your men over on, the, on uh, James Island. The tide is coming up. The British don't know about it yet. They're freezing. You can't build a fire. And half of your men are lost in the dark in the woods because they had to do it on a no moonlight night, of course. So they had to undo it. They got the men back. I'm sure, although there were no casualties of war, just think how many people you got sick getting them in the, in the, in the water in the night in January where you can't build a fire. 
So that was one of his plans. And the final plan that we're going to talk about a little bit today is that Lawrence probably had malaria or something like that, but the British were commanded in the Southern Department by General Alexander Leslie, who got orders in May to start evacuating the South. What happens was, um, okay.
it's, it's written, come be he, but you got to say it, come be, or everybody will know you're not from here. <laughs> come be right. The cup of rubber and UG. So that's just a little guy in the conversation. <laughs> the rest of them went down here in the Port Royal Sound. Green got intelligence of this raid. Green detached Mordecai Gist of the Maryland line and troops from his camp at Ashley Hall Plantation, which is now part of Magnolia Plantation, about midway down the Ashley River, to go down to Cumbie Ferry. And Cumbie Ferry is exactly where Highway 17 today crosses the Cumbie River. And, um, and so he goes there. When Gist gets there, he finds that this de detachment right here has gone up here. There's the ferry, it's right there where that little green dot is. Has gone up there. And the only problem is this, is the Gist is over here on this side of the river and the British are over here on this side of the river. And if you've ever driven over that um, area, the causeway is about a mile wide. And so for the guests to go across that causeway, and the causeway now is two lane road at least, if not four, you know, it was a narrow road across like a rice dike, and it would be murder to, to go across. So guest gets there, he, he arrives, let's see, gosh, he arrives at the, he arrives at the scene, and he does a couple things. Number one, he didn't have any boats, so he can't force his way across the Cumbie River. So he takes and detaches his cavalry to go north, Continental Cavalry, to go north to the Salt Catcher Bridge, cross there, and come down the west side of the Cumbie River. Now that is about where Highway 17A crosses the Cumbie River, right on the east side of Yemassee. Now, the causeway and bridge there today is not exactly in the same location. It was in the 18th century, but you get the idea. And you say, Charles, how do you know all this stuff? <laughs> I got lucky, That's like any researcher. You were um, there. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is my rule. You never know what you're going to find until you look. You never know what you're going to find until you look. So, um, Jim Legg, wonderful archaeologist at Skia, and I were talking about this, and he said, Charles, I think I've seen a map of this. I don't know where, and I think it's the Dartmouth map. That's all I had to go on. I said, hmm, Dartmouth map, that's good. So I called up um, Steve Weiss, who's the curator at the museum at Paris Island, and he said, yes, um, there is a such a thing as the Dartmouth map. I've seen it, have no idea where it was, and no, I don't have a copy. If I did, I wouldn't give it to you anyway. <laughs> okay, so I knew that there was a, a Dartmouth map, and, um, and so luckily I have a brilliant niece who had gotten herself into Dartmouth, and so I assigned her to go over to the University Library and say, y'all have a Revolutionary War map of South Carolina in your collection? She did that for me, and they said, heck no, we have nothing like that. And um, thankfully, thankfully, she's a young lady of great persistence. And she went back about a month later and happened upon a special collections librarian. And the special collection librarian said, I know maybe where to look. And so they look in one of these collections that has the name on it of the collector of the maps, and bingo, there it was. A Hessian soldier had drawn this beautiful map, and not only had he done that, he had written a, a first-person narrative about what they did and where. So that's, that's a copy of the map, but I know this is not a great copy of it, but if you look at it geographically, it's exactly perfect. Um, over here in fairly uh, English that uh, Leon um, and Will Graves, who can read uh, bad handwriting, help me uh, determine, is the narrative written out. Um, right there is the line of smaller sloops sailing in St. Helena Sound, going up here up the Cumbie River. 
and it says that they met some um, some Americans at Tar Bluff and had a little battle with them. Here's the rest of the fleet down here next to Hilton Head Island, where they are waiting on these guys to get finished and come down here, and uh, they're getting ready to do their raid. And you can see a bunch of boats up there in Broad River, which is interesting because this is the same place that the British went in January of 1779, when they were doing a little diversionary raid while Prevo was getting ready to invade uh, South Carolina. So, here is uh, General Mapp. Guess arrives here at Highway 17 at the Columbia River, sends the cavalry way up here to Salt Catcher Bridge to, come, to, to cross. The British, I'm sure, get the word that they're coming. They get in their boats on the tide at 2 a.m. And you know you get to ride free on these rivers, depending on which way you want to go twice a day, and just slip down the river. And it took guest men two hours to figure out their gun. Now, to be fair, from this side of the river over here is at least a mile because you got a, a river there, which is a substantial river, which got all these salt marshes at the time and later now. Uh, remnants of rice paddies. On the, to the scene rides out of his sick bed John Lawrence. Now John Lawrence was in charge of a mixed brigade of light infantry and cavalry. John Lawrence, even though he's sick in bed, suffering in Charleston, hears about this raid, hears that Gist is gone, and thinks that this is his last opportunity to get in on the fight. And guess what? He was right. <laughs> so Gist detaches him to go downstream to a place called Tar Bluff, set up a battery, and take on the British as they're, as they're going down the river downstream. It's about 20 miles by water, and maybe John and I have guessed about 12 miles by land. And so, so you can actually, actually do that. Now, some of the literature had read, had said there was an action at Tar Bluff. We have a newspaper report of it in the Loyalist newspaper. We have some correspondence between Mordecai Guest and Nathaniel Green. We have some correspondence between um, uh, a couple of the lesser officers. But unfortunately, people over the years had forgotten where the battle was other than the general name of it. The other thing magically that happened is that when David Ruhr and I got interested in doing some work in the Buford area, we had looked all around and guessed where this might be, where this battlefield might be. I was cleaning up a couple years later and found in an envelope a map that was contemporaneously done of the battle. And when I found that map that somebody had sent to me, I said, Eureka, we have found it. I now know where it, the battle was. Except that no matter how I tried to put the map on the ground today, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I just couldn't. I knew it was sort of in a sort of air, but I couldn't figure it out. That's when John Allison and I started talking about it. And I'd like for John to come up now and talk a little bit about what
how we, how, how we define it. Okay. Now, a couple of years ago, I got a call from Doug Bostick, who's sitting over here in the South Carolina Battlefields Preservation Trust. And, and Doug said, you know, there's a, some property owners down in one part of the state, Charleston specifically, and they're wondering if there's a battle on their property. And I told them that you may be able to find it. And I said, well, I can try. What's a, what? He said, well, it's Tar Bluff. And I said, well, I know that John Lawrence was killed there. I know that it's somewhere in the lower part of the state. And I think it was about the last battle of any import in South Carolina, maybe in the American Revolution, late in 1782, just three months before the British were going to abandon the Charleston Peninsula. <coughs> so I called Charles. And I said, Charles, I know you have something on the rice raids because you gave me a rough copy of it one time when you were working on it. And I remember there being something about John Lawrence in there. And Charles said, oh yeah, I worked on it some more. It's not complete. As Charles always tells me when he sends me things, do not send this to anyone. In <laughs> <laughs> any circumstances or you'll lose your life. And, and so he sent it to me and I started reading it. And I thought there might be enough of a lead footprint to find the battlefield, but I wasn't sure. And I thought that maybe it was down on that Economy River, based on some of the geography, and I'll show you some of that in just a few minutes, based on the maps. Charles and I talked about it, I called Doug back, and we went down, Doug and I met with the property owners down in Charleston. And I, I asked the, uh, one of the gentlemen there, I said, well, how large is your property? First of all, he, he told me he thought there was a battlefield on his property. And I said, well, I think there could be two based on what I'm looking at here, but I don't know exactly the size of your property or where it's located. I said, how large is your property? He said, oh, it's only 12,000 acres. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, that's over four miles square. Now, where on this property is this little battle, this little left footprint, if we can even find it, on, on 12,000 acres? Well, the first thing I did after consulting with Charles, and we talked about this at length, I didn't go down there initially. We did, we did a lot of work on this back and forth trying to figure out where do we ice, what, what area do we isolate to look for this battlefield. And the, just to, to use a point of reference, I started with the Mills Atlas, of course. And if you're looking at this, it's awful hard to see where you are. Uh, I, I'm just going to point these out to you. That is the Conde Ferry that Charles was talking about. There's right here, you can't see it, but right right there, it says Tar Bluff. And we know that it was called the Battle of Tar Bluff. Now, in some maps, it's, 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 it's really called Conde Bluff. But in this case, Mills Atlas in 1820 has Tar Bluff right there. So is the bluff here? Is it there? Is, is this the bluff? It's down here in the corner. And we know that the British when they left the area, left at Fields Point, which is right there. So I've got Fields Point and Tar Bluff, so I'm thinking it might be somewhere in these several hundred acres in here, but I really don't know. I really don't have any idea at this point, other than I'm gonna to have to go down there and start looking and, and drive around and, and examine the area and see if I can come up with a search square to start with. And uh, Mike Yiannopoulos and I, Mike Yiannopoulos is not here today, unfortunately, but he works with Doug. And uh, Mike is a huge help, not only here, but in other places that I've been uh, as part of our archaeological crew. And so Mike and I spent some time down there mapping and GPS in different places. And uh, this is the Google Earth. And by the time we really started looking at this, we decided, we decided that this is Tar Bluff. From here to here is about one and a quarter miles. So the bluff is really large. Phil's point is right down here is Fields Point. So Tar Bluff, Fields Point, somewhere probably in this area. This is the road on the middle of Atlas. This road right here is there in 1780. It runs all the way down to Fields Point. So we started by looking up here with no success. Then we went out into this area. Now, in the meantime, Charles had told me that he had a map, a secret map. And it had also come from the dark ones. Library, and it looked like this. It's the tin line map. A L tin line, T I N L I N E, at the bottom of the page, drew this map. Now we have no idea. We can't find any evidence of who A L tin line was. 
He's obviously not a British officer because he would have a commission and it would say Captain Tim Line or Ensign Tim Line or Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Tim Line. So he must have been a civilian. And if you look at this, this is Tar Bluff. He calls it Combi Bluff. This is Tar Bluff, and Phil's Point is right down here. Well, they're showing, he's showing the battle thing up here. Again, we have no idea who this guy is. And he draws the troop positions. And over here, he draws the troop positions. But folks, I'll tell you, I can't find it. This, that's the map that baffled Charles. It baffled us too, because I can't find anywhere on here where these sloughs are. I can't find where that, that, that ditch that he shows. He shows a ditch right here. It shows two sloughs. This is where the British land, there and down here, but mainly here, off these ships because they could not get back by Tar Bluff. He shows a redoubt here. This redoubt was playing on these ships when they came down, and that redoubt was 12 and a half, double, a double 12 and a half pound cannon. Double means it was made in Massachusetts and it was double thickness being an iron cannon, so it wouldn't break as easily. So they had a double 12 and a half pound here, plus Lawrence crew down there had a five and a half inch howitzer brass howitzer, which is very valuable. So they're playing on the shipping coming by, and the British, of course, are going to do the only thing they know how to do. Park the ships up here, get off them, take boats into these sloughs, and go and move these folks out of the way. So Lawrence, this is where Lawrence made his attack here, and he was killed somewhere in here, but I can't figure out where the sloughs are. So, we had Mike, Mike Yiannopoulos run something called light like detection and ranging uh, radar. It's L-I-D-A-R is, is what we call, call it LIDAR all the time. And when he did that, something popped up. It showed us two sloughs and it showed us, see this ditch? There's the ditch. And we walked down there, we found the ditch and we found the sloughs. Now, if you look at this, these are big sloughs going this way, and the ditch goes this way, and this whole area from here to here is about one and a quarter miles. If you look at this, this area from here to here is about 130 yards. So this is a little tiny, tiny piece of this big part of the bluff. The tin line is way, way out of proportion on this, but we've got the sloughs where they, where they disembark, and we've got where the about where the redoubt should have been. It's now down in the water. This, this, this bluff has receded about 40 to 50 meters since 1939, Lord knows how much since 1782. So now we're thinking it's up in here somewhere. Well, we finally do find it around Christmas and New Year's of 2017, and this is the first artifact scouting that we have on it. It's back here, that's what we're finding. So now our job is to figure out uh, how wide this is, get as many artifacts as we can, and try to define uh, this battle. So we start looking. Uh, this gentleman right here is Mike Baxter. He's in the back of the room. He's part of our crew. He does a wonderful job for us. By the way, there's somebody else here who's part of this crew, this archaeological crew. Dr. Jeff Klein sitting right over here is a huge help. So both of these are part of this archaeological crew. Yeah, big help. Uh, both, both of these gentlemen are part of the archaeological crew that, that, that helped me. And it's really more like a, a team effort. Uh, and there are a number of others. And I'll tell you that professional archaeologists, as Charles and others that know us, will tell you they're terribly, terribly jealous of my crew because they're really, really good. And they're also free. They're all <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's Mike Baxter and I, and we're right in the middle of the battlefield. This, you walk down and you have no idea where this battlefield is. We're walking in the middle of a Revolutionary War battlefield. No one has ever found them when you were a boss. This is it for finding artifacts right here. Very good. Uh, this will show you part of the battlefield and part of the problem we have with, with, with it, is, it is so grown up in places that bush hog, and the reason they bush hog and have it grown up is because this is really more of a gentleman's quail hunting club yeah. on 12,000 acres, okay? They've got their own dogs, they've got their own quail they raised down there, own kennels, and uh, it is wonderful for quail. Uh, so that's the reason they leave it grown up. So it made it difficult at times uh, to be able to look. Another slide, that's us looking. This is Mark Ward, <coughs> he's a huge help, a good friend of Mike Yiannopoulos. Uh, he helped a lot down there, and he's helped me other places too. But that, we're, we're right in the middle of the battlefield, you, you would never know it. 
That's our crew. You'll always see us smiling because I'll tell you, this is no fun unless you have fun. you got to have fun. And these guys, as anyone that knows them will tell you, they all have fun. You can see here, we're all smiling. And, and we always do, don't we, Mike Baxter? That is true. So, <laughs> Especially if it's in the snow or the rain. And the rain. <laughs> Extremely inclement miles away from, from the nearest bathroom or, or, or and this is Brett Bennett from Mount Pleasant. He is also a huge part of the crew. Uh, this is an area west of the battlefield. You can see how grown up this is. And there are actually one, two, three, four people here. You can barely see them. But this is a not, it really shows you how they manage the timber property down there, the timber on the property down there. They do a wonderful job of conservation down there. Uh, and, and it also shows you, again, how difficult it was for us to find artifacts. Uh, so we're not sure, so sure that this area didn't have more artifacts in it, but that's for another day. Uh, every time we do a, uh, a project, I always come up with some idea we're going to have some type of uh, mascot. Now, we've had old cur dogs, we've had uh, pointers that, that uh, deer hunters have lost when they're running deer. We've had beagles that have been lost by rabbit hunters. This is the first time we ever had a timber rattler as our, uh, as our mascot. And I thought that was an appropriate mascot. And you'll notice how close we are here, all four of us. You know, well, you think that we're really brave sorts, and you don't think, I'm not, I'm not scared of snakes, but I do have a certain respect for the poisonous ones, because I have been this before, and it's no fun. This boy right here is pretty close to us, but if you'll notice, we're not that brave, because we all have on snake boots, which is a necessity to go down on, on our bluff. Now, we got them to burn this off in March of 2018, went back several days in, in, in terrible heat and uh, and, and, and uh, humidity down there at the end of April. And this is what it looks like burned off. So we recovered a lot more artifacts. You can see behind there how high that is. It didn't burn that far back. But this is the part of the battlefield. This, this, this is part of where the British were actually. And you can see Mike Yanopoulos here with one, two, three flags. One, two, three flags, the bags. So he's pulling stuff up, bagging it, we GPS it later. And he is looking right now, again, right between the British and between this lines and Brereton, Brereton's lines, Major Brereton's lines. So um, we, we did recover a whole lot of artifacts. Uh, I think a lot of artifacts based on the uh, uh, based on the length of time we were down there and the terrain. And uh, this next gentleman is uh, Dave Shutram. He's retired. He's on the crew also. He's a retired uh, federal meteorologist, and he has just found.